Gospel of John, and we'll finish our study on the life of Lazarus, found in John chapter 11. And as you go there, I want to uh, just uh, say it's been a privilege to get to uh, preach through this particular section, and we're coming to the end of this series, which means uh, next week we're going to start a new series, and by we, I mean Pastor West, because I'm going on sabbatical starting tomorrow, so... Uh, that's kind of fun, I know. Heidi and I will be gone for uh, two months, so eight weeks. Yay, I know. <laughs> Thanks, Janelle. I know, we'll be happy. Um, well, it's good to know. It's good to know. I know. <laughs> no, we... Uh, we are really thankful the board has uh, given us this opportunity to kind of get away, the, the purpose of which is for sabbatical rest and also for some studying. But we're going to actually be down in uh, Mexico, in Puerto Vallarta, for about seven weeks. And so we're excited to kind of settle in and take a little time away. But you're in good hands. Pastor West is, is preparing to preach out of uh, 1 Corinthians. And so that should be excellent. I just share this with you because I know I've talked to a lot of people that have been around pastors who go on sabbatical and don't come back. And so I just want to assure those who are afraid of that, uh, that we are coming back and excited uh, about what's happening here uh, in our church family. And for those of you who were hopeful that we wouldn't, I uh, just wanted to let you know so you could kind of prepare yourself mentally that, that we will be back, yeah, um, in case you were disappointed. Oh, good. Uh, if you would, uh, actually, let's uh, begin this morning by reading out of uh, Psalm chapter 28, just to kind of prepare our hearts uh, to hear God's word this morning. And so I'd encourage you, I'm going to read uh, the 28th Psalm for us and uh, we kind of focus our attention towards the word this morning. To you, Lord, I call. You are my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me. For if you remain silent, I will be like those who go down to the pit. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift up my hands towards your most holy place. Do not drag me away with the wicked, with those who do evil, who speak cordially with their neighbors but harbor malice in their hearts. Repay them for their evil deeds and for their evil works. Repay them for their hands have done, for what their hands have done, and bring back on them what they deserve because they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord and what his hands have done. He will tear them down and never build them up again. Praise be the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song I praise him. The Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you that your word is in our presence and before us. But we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would make us alive to your word and make your word alive in us today. In your name, amen. Verse 45 of John 11 begins, Therefore which means it points us back to the last couple weeks in which we looked at the, the life of Lazarus and the death of Lazarus, and then uh, it kind of accumulates in the previous verses in which we see Jesus resurrect Lazarus, call him out of the grave by the word of God, the Son of God, that which is dead is now made alive again. It's an incredible miracle, which is in front of everyone, and Jesus says, take off his grave clothes and let him go. And we see Lazarus comes stumbling or bounding, or I don't know how he came out of the grave, a little bound by his grave clothes and let go and set free, being completely restored by the word of Jesus. And then in verse 45, it says, I'm seeing this many who had come down from Jerusalem. Remember in chapter 10, how there was this growing controversy around the nature of Christ and around whether we should believe in him, believe that he is the Messiah, believe that he's the one that's going to lead God's people, or whether we had to stick with kind of the religious leaders who were in control of the temple and in control of the religious community, and that this had kind of created this conflict between Jesus and these religious leaders. And so many people now came down and saw this and began to turn their allegiance 
to Jesus. Before we kind of go too far here, I want to say that we need to take this particular understanding of their belief in context. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? Now, you and I, uh, having read this, having understood uh, seeing Christ or hearing that Christ has risen from the dead, we as Christians put our faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's where the foundation of our faith is. Found again, if we remember, on the, on the basic principle, the most rudimentary theological principle, and that is that God loves us, that Jesus died for us, that he rose again, and it is in this fact that we put our faith in him. And so we believe that he has established his kingdom, that he rules at the right hand of God the Father, and that he rules through the power of the Holy Spirit amongst his people living in this world. And this world is still fallen, and yet God is saving those from this fallen world and welcoming them into his kingdom. So that's kind of how we we view when we think about Jesus. But we have to remember that those who are putting their belief in Jesus very much had a very narrow understanding of what the Messiah was going to do. He was going to primarily reestablish God's people in Jerusalem and in the greater kingdom of Israel. So they were looking for someone who would take on, in other words, build a Jewish coalition to cast out the Romans, right? Get rid of the Herodian kingdom, which was a tainted kingdom, and establish kind of this peaceful kingdom right there in real time and, you know, kind of in the flesh, so to speak. And so when people began following Jesus, there was this anticipation that he would essentially establish a core group of people who would develop an army, fight against the Romans, get rid of the Herodians, establish the kingdom there at the temple. And this is when, you know, John's mom comes to Jesus and says, let my kids be on the right hand and the left hand. That's what they're thinking. They're thinking, you know, Jesus is going to get this group of people. They're going to rule over Israel. And so we see that some of those who saw Jesus' miracles believed and said, we're going to join him, and yet others would appear, rather than joining kind of that movement, would go in the different direction. They would go back to Jerusalem. It says in verse 46, but some of them went to the Pharisees, these are the religious leaders, and told them what Jesus had done. This was a pretty incredible miracle that he was able to bring somebody back from the dead. And I would suggest to you that maybe they thought, if you can bring people back from the dead, you would have yourself a pretty good army. Right? Resurrected people make for good warriors because you could keep bringing them back from the dead. It would be very frustrating fighting a war with someone who is able to resurrect the dead. And so in verse 47, we see the chief priests and the Pharisees calling a meeting together and asking the question, what are we accomplishing? We must ask, and we can assume a couple things about the religious leaders at this point. And that is they believed that they were the way in which God was going to reestablish his people in his kingdom. Through their faithfulness to, to the Torah, to operating the temple, And by the way, the way in which they maintained their power in Jerusalem was to make deals with the Romans and the Herodians. They had created kind of this peace in Jerusalem by saying, okay, the Romans, you can come this far. We're not going to fight you. We'll pay our taxes. And the Herodians, you get the temple and you get your cut. But we will kind of protect the temple and the nation of Israel And we are the kind of keepers of it. And they saw themselves as essentially the saviors of God's people. This is why they see Jesus as a threat. And we can see what they really wanted was what? Our kingdom, our temple, our place. It was very small in Jerusalem, but they had this distinct sense in which it was theirs. You and I have this understanding that Jesus comes with the express purpose of actually, you know, not just fixing the the social and political, the outward enemies. Most of us think that our greatest enemies are outside somewhere. Those who are against us, those who would mock us or make fun of us or 
this group of people over here, the disease that I might catch one day. Like these are the outward things. And Jesus says the enemy is, is within. It's your sinful heart. That's what Jesus came to conquer. That's what Jesus came to address. And the people who were the religious leaders, they couldn't see the enemy within. They only saw this kind of outward enemy. And so we see that they're afraid that if people go to Jesus, he will raise up a group of people and the Romans will come in and wipe them out. And they had worked very hard to maintain peace with the world. Peace with these different groups of people. And so we see then in verse 47 through 48 what the religious leaders are truly afraid of. And it's really what we all are kind of a fear, fearful of. It's the lordship of Christ. It's that he is in control. And if he's in control, he might mess it up. I prefer to be in control of my own life. I prefer to be in control of my own moral systems where Jesus and I can agree. And, you know, I think the religious leaders were happy to try to work with Jesus if he would come under their authority, but he never would. And so they finally said, we have to get rid of him. And they had been fairly unsuccessful at getting rid of Jesus. And I w would argue that, you know, they were, their frustration was mostly due to the fact that they didn't really understand the nature of Christ. They thought, well, why don't we just kill him? And they can't get rid of him. And the reason for that is actually found in John 10. If we read verse 18, Jesus says, no one can take my life from me. Says, no one can take it, referring to his life from me. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it back up. So that Jesus claimed that nobody could kill him, including the religious leaders, which led to their great frustration. So that Caiaphas kind of has an outburst that the chief priests, right? We see him in verse 49, that you're speaking up and say, you know nothing at all. You don't understand the gravity of the situation. We are going to lose our power, and if we lose our power, we could lose the kingdom itself. Our whole purpose, our whole sense of identity of who we are. And so he says, you don't realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. We must take swift action lest we lose everything we've worked for. And John then explains that Caiaphas did not say this on his own, but that he had had this prophetic word earlier that year that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take Jesus' life interesting, isn't it? How we see two things happening in this passage. We see what the people, the religious leaders, their perspective, what they want to take place, and they have their purpose, and we see that God has his purpose, that God is actually sovereign, that Jesus is going to do things his way, and yet there is this kind of strange overlap, isn't it? That God uses this prophetic word, not in the way that Caiaphas thinks. Caiaphas thinks, we get rid of Jesus, that way we stay in control, that way we can help the people of Israel be preserved and ultimately saved, that those could come back and the temple will be maintained for God's purpose. But actually, Jesus says, no, no, that's not why I'm going to die. I'm going to die so that all people might be saved. That God's kingdom is much different than just this little city or this temple, or this plot of land. I will destroy the temple, and I'll rebuild it in three days. And, and ironically, it, it's interesting, just historically, that the fear that they had, that they would lose their nation and their temple, takes place 70 years later. When we want to be Lord, when we want control, when we kind of get rid of God's sovereignty in our life and say, you know, God, you're not really sovereign. I'm going to be the one controlling everything out of fear. 
probably in about 70 years, all your fears will take place. We're going to tap it. But if you relent, if you believe in Christ, if you lay your life at his feet, as the one who can raise the dead to life, you belong to this other kingdom that Jesus establishes. We see that actually this pattern several times in the Bible, most notably uh, with this guy named Balaam in Numbers uh, 22 and 24, that Jesus uses, or God uses this um, false prophet, this kind of, I don't know, witch doctor, that the enemies of Israel, they want to curse God's people. And so they hire this guy, and he comes in, and they say, curse him, and all the guy can do is keep blessing the people of Israel. That God is always sovereign. He will accomplish his work. He will accomplish his work amongst his people. And we see it very much present in the person and work of Jesus Christ in this story. And the resurrection of Lazarus is a signpost, is a testament to this work of Jesus, this power that Christ has. We also, it's interesting to note that, uh, and just as a side note, and then we'll move on. But there was a guy named Barabbas. You guys remember the story of Barabbas? It's just mentioned briefly, but he was the guy who Pontius Pilate offered to release Jesus instead of this criminal. And the problem with Barabbas is he was part of an insurrection in which he committed murder, and so the Romans took him. And he was the exact person that the Jews were fearful of. And they ended up, out of self-preservation, choosing him rather than Christ. And when self-preservation is our key, is the thing that we're living for, we will often make the wrong choice religiously. We will also uh, often make terrible decisions. And certainly the people, the leaders in the Sanhedrin, believing they were right, made a terrible decision. They chose to plot against Jesus and to kill him, thinking that they would accomplish their own will only to find out that they were on the wrong side and they were just simply accomplishing the will of God for what purpose? To actually save the very people that they were afraid of, their enemies. Well, you might say, Eric, I thought this was about Lazarus. You're right. I got a little sidetracked. I apologize. Let's go to chapter 12 and get back on track. What happened with Lazarus? I like Lazarus. He's a good guy. He's a really interesting character in the Bible, I think. Uh, so far, uh, he's kind of the center of the story, and yet he doesn't really do a lot. So let's look at uh, John chapter 12, where he's mentioned several more times. It says, six days before the Passover, uh, Jesus came to Bethany. Now, what's happened in between? It's worth noting that there's this time gap in which Jesus goes to Ephraim. We see that at the end of chapter 11, and he basically hides out. He says, I'm not going to confront the people in Jerusalem. I'm going to go and wait for God's timing. And I'll just say, again, as a very uh, side note, Sometimes we don't like to wait for God's timing. Isn't that a hard thing? You can imagine the disciples are like, you just raised Lazarus from the dead. People are believing in you. This is the time to strike. You know, we got, we got something going here. And, and Jesus moves away. He gets out of the way again. He's frustrating, I'd imagine, as, as the disciples who would have thought, like, we're going to establish a kingdom. We're going to take Jerusalem. And, and now we're hiding out in this podunk town called Ephraim. When Mary, uh, not Mary, when Martha comes out to see Jesus after her brother had died, it says that the first thing she confronts Jesus with was something in the past. If you had come, if you had been here before. And Jesus says, your brother will rise again. And she then goes, I know in the future, in the final day, he'll rise. And what does Jesus say? He says, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. I think there's an important lesson when we struggle with the timing, how come God operates the way he does, is we can take our eyes off the fact that he is. He is yesterday. He is today. He is tomorrow. He is forever. That God is. He is love. He is faithful. He is true today. No matter what our circumstances is, what you and I tend to struggle with is we think our circumstances is the problem. And God wants to step in and whatever your circumstances and say I am and I imagine the disciples needed to focus on the fact that Jesus was 
in Ephraim. He was there. And then we see in verse uh, 1 of John chapter 12, the movement starts to happen. Jesus comes back to Bethany, and it says he comes where, uh, to the house where Lazarus lived. The same Lazarus who Jesus had raised from the dead. In verse 2 of John uh, 12, it says, Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served. I love Martha. She's doing her thing. Hospitable Martha. Faithful to the end. Just consistent doing what Martha does. And then it says, While Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. What is Lazarus is doing? He's, he's sitting at the table. In fact, he's just mentioned as one of a bunch of people having dinner together. And then Mary, who I don't, I don't like Mary as much, but Mary goes and gets this pint of pure nard, mostly because I feel a lot of conviction when I read about Mary. And, and her whole life is so geared towards Jesus that she pours this, you know, this family perfume that would have been probably her most valuable thing. And she just lays it out at Jesus' feet. She wants everyone to, to hear, see, smell that Jesus is present before. And she does this incredible act that most of us remember. So incredible that it kind of creates this whole discussion that follows, that we won't go down through verse 8. And, and, and lost in the middle of it is Lazarus. Who's doing what? Sitting. He's sitting at the table eating. And I think, here's a guy I can, I can get, get along with. Me and Lazarus. How do you follow Jesus? I like to sit and eat. That's my big thing. It's the way I really show Jesus my devotion. Sit at the table and have my sister bring me some food. That sounds like Lazarus. What's interesting about this whole thing is what, when we get down to verse 9, it says, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out Jesus was there and came. They wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to hear, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus. Why Lazarus? It says at the end of verse 9, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. But I think this is important for us to to draw from the life of Lazarus is not that he did anything. In fact, go back. What did Lazarus ever do? Right? The whole story is all about what Mary and Martha do. In fact, we remember Mary and Martha a lot because they're doing all kinds of stuff. It's all recorded here. It's not recorded anything that Lazarus has done. It'd be interesting, wouldn't it? What was his experience? Have any of you thought of Lazarus like in the grave, like what was going on when he got resurrected? Was he in heaven? Was he with God? Was he in the presence of, of God at that moment? Did he have to come back from that? We don't know because he didn't write a book. He missed a great opportunity to write Four Days in Heaven by Lazarus from Bethany. But John gives us no account of it. He gives us tons about his sisters, but nothing from Lazarus. Why? Because it's not about what Lazarus did, is it? It's about what Jesus did for Lazarus. That Lazarus' life points to Christ, not because of something Lazarus is doing, but because of what Jesus has done for Lazarus. How important is that for us to hear? Some of us have a, have a tendency, and I think probably all of us, to be a gravely concerned about what have I done for Jesus. Like that's the great testimony that we have for the world is that what we do. In fact, I think that's the problem with the religious leaders. They were very concerned about what they were doing for God and missing what God was doing for them. I don't think the Apostle Paul missed this on the road to Emmaus or the road to Damascus when he thought he was God's man doing God's work, only to find out that Jesus Christ had really resurrected from the dead. He was on his throne in heaven and confronted him. So he would write to the church in Ephesus these words, and I hope they're familiar to you. Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the rulers of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work, and those who are disobedient. All of us 
also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of God's wrath. The early Pharisees, those who were in charge of the Sanhedrin, they tried to make a deal with the world. They thought their preservation was reliant on them and their cleverness. The church has often, over the centuries, made deals for our own preservation. If we're going to keep our church, we need to get along with the world that is around us. Become aware of that. As we drive kind of down the streets and you see that during June kind of gay pride month and these flags and I go, oh man, what are we doing? How could we fly a, 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 a flag of pride? Pride is the, the top sin that we are called to repent of. And we would celebrate that which brings not flourishing, but brings destruction on individuals and our children and our lives. And as I was driving, feeling quite proud of myself, I was convicted with this question, what pride flag am I dry, flying? What sin am I openly in front of God flaunting and just saying, I'll do this. I'm my own Lord. I'm my own Savior. I don't need God. We often fly pride flags or we condemn others. We are not called as Christians to make deals. We are called as Christians to recognize that you and I, by nature, from birth, are deserving of the wrath of God. But let's not stop there in verse 4. Paul says this, But because of his great love, that's the building block of all theology, Paul says, but because of God's great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourself. It is the gift of God. It is not by your works, so that none of us can boast. We do not boast. We know that you and I are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good work, which God has prepared for us in advance. We see his sovereign hand in our lives. As believers, we believe that God has reached down and has saved us, has called us out, has chosen to bestow his mercy and grace in our lives. What a gift. We, like Lazarus, are called in the midst of a world which is headed for destruction to point to the one who does it for us. Not anything that we do, but what Christ has done for us. This is the message. It means this, that Though the world has all kinds of difficulties and, and destruction and all the bad stuff, and I'm sure most of us are aware of it, we proclaim that Jesus Christ is on the throne. That, we, that he is the resurrection and the life, and in him we have eternal hope today. And it is not because of anything that we have done. It is because of what Jesus Christ did for us when he purchased us on the cross. And so we can live in the midst of this world with hope. And I love how Lazarus is now attached to Jesus. That not having done anything, his whole life is now this signpost to what Christ has done, and it closes, and the last thing we know about Lazarus is this, that they not only plot to kill Jesus, but they plot to kill, they, we got to kill Lazarus again. we got to put him back in the grave. And I would suggest to us that when we are in Christ, when he is Lord, it will cause us to be in conflict 
with those who oppose him. There will not be a union, and we are not called to make deals. We are called to proclaim Christ. We are called to put him as number one. Our church is not about self-preservation in our culture. Our church is about pointing people to the Savior because we are preserved by what Christ has done. We have eternal life. There's nothing that the world can do to us. They cannot even take our life. Our life is secure in Christ. Just as no one could take Jesus' life unless he laid it down so your life in Christ is held for all eternity in his hand. And you don't have to be afraid. We simply have to point people to the one who saves. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word this morning. We reflect back on the life of Lazarus and we recognize like him there's not much we can do in this in this world except again this morning receive by faith your mercy and your grace we thank you for that we thank you and praise you and ask that our lives would continue to point towards you in your name amen amen praise god